Well, welcome to episode 256 of 10 Minute Record Reviews, and this time I'm going to talk about Idris Muhammad's excellent album from 1974, Power of Soul. And what I have here is a 2017 re-release. It was originally released on Kudu in 1974. This is actually a music on vinyl slash Sony slash Epic release from 2017 which, however, it sounds pretty darn good, great snap to the snare drums, great bottom end overall, so I would recommend it if you can't find an early pressing. Idris Muhammad was a genre-crossing drummer who was equally at home in both the jazz and the funk lanes, although he always considered himself to be much more of a soul and funk drummer than a jazz drummer at heart. He was incredibly prolific as a recording artist, particularly sought after as a studio player. He plays on something like 130 plus different releases that were recorded at Rudy Van Gilder's studio alone, let alone the rest of his recorded output. This is his first outing for Kudu, which was this boutique jazz funk label which Creed Taylor set up as part of his CTI label umbrella in the early 1970s. Muhammad appears on something like 20 Kudu releases, and his work is amongst the most sampled rare groove stuff in the hip-hop age, and this was actually something he was quite proud of and happy to see happen. Idris Muhammad was born in November 1939 in New Orleans. His birth name was Leo Morris. His dad was a banjo player. He also had four other siblings who were drummers as well as himself. His family was well connected into the musical hotbed that was New Orleans in the 1950s and close family friends included the Neville brothers. And that connection proves important because at the age of 14 he was asked by Arthur Neville to join his band the Hawkettes. Being with the Hawkettes provided all kinds of opportunity. Not least was the chance to be recorded on vinyl at age 14 on their track Mardi Gras Mambo. The Hawkettes would also back up major R&B stars coming through New Orleans on the so-called Chitlin circuit, and so young Leo gets the opportunity to meet people like Muddy Waters and play with them. At 16, he's the drummer on Fats Domino's recording of Blueberry Hill, and it's also through this connection that he gets to meet Sam Cooke. In the later 50s, he briefly becomes part of Cooke's touring band, long enough to get introduced to New York and catch the Big Apple bug before returning home. And this connection with the Hawkettes was also how he met the R&B star Jerry Butler. Butler and Curtis Mayfield had started the Impressions in Chicago, but by the late 50s, Butler had gone solo. Leo met Butler in one of these backup gigs, and Butler was impressed by the youngster's capacity playing multiple instruments and also general musical sense. So he asked him, for this kid that turned 20, whether he'd become his musical director, and Leo says yes. So he travels to Chicago, and there he plays with Butler, but he also gets introduced to Curtis Mayfield and ends up, for a time, joining the Impressions, about three, three and a half years. This was an incredible apprenticeship, but as the early 60s wore on, the Chicago winters began to wear on a guy who had grown up in New Orleans, and on top of that, he was dating at this point a woman called Dolores Brooks, who was a singer with the Crystals, and she was living in New York. So sometime around 1964, he tells Mayfield he's leaving, he's going to head to New York. So Mayfield gives him a suitcase, says, don't open this until you get to New York, and when he got there, he opens it up, apparently it was full of cash. When he got to New York, he needed to find some work. Well, soon enough, he feel the embrace of the jazz world, but to begin with, he needed some money coming in. So he went to the Apollo Theater in Harlem and he met Russell Phillips, who was the manager of the house band there. Now, his name had gotten around because of the Chitlin circuit, and so Phillips knew who he was. So when he shows up, says, look, I'm in town, I'm looking for work, Phillips says, thanks very much for letting me know, fires his current drummer right away and hires Morris. Around this point, too, he converts to Islam, and he and Dolores, whom he would marry in 1966, both take Arabic names, he takes Idris Muhammad, and she takes the name Sakina. Now, to get in with the jazz world, initially, Muhammad starts hanging around Birdland, sitting in whenever he could, and he gets to meet and eventually gets to play with a whole bunch of established stars. People like Kenny Dorham, Horace Silver, Lou Donaldson, and Betty Carter. He was such a talent that it didn't take too long before he landed a really good job as essentially the in-house drummer for Prestige Records. He also applied in 1967 to be the drummer in a new production of a musical off-Broadway called Hair, which of course ultimately moves on Broadway, and he is actually the drummer on the original cast recording of the soundtrack. He plays on a ton of records for Lou Donaldson, whose own work was getting funkier and funkier in no small part because of his association with Muhammad. Those include Elegant Boogaloo and Everything I Play is Funky, the connection with Donaldson was also important because Donaldson was recording with Blue Note, which, if passed its best as a label, was still putting out some pretty good music, and importantly, was still using Rudy Van Gelder regularly as their engineer. And that connection between Muhammad and Van Gelder is key because the two of them worked quite seriously over a number of years to really perfect the sound that Muhammad was getting out of his drums, such that on records like this, you really hear the fruits of that. 
Moving into the 70s, Muhammad continues to straddle the worlds of jazz, soul, and R&B, becoming Roberta Flack's regular drummer pretty much throughout her chart-topping years. He also puts out his first two releases as a leader on Prestige Records, where, as I mentioned, he'd become a fixture, Black Rhythm Revolution in 1970 and Peace and Rhythm in 1971. These are both pretty good records, if not as squarely and as fully developed in the jazz funk lane as his work would become. They're pretty eclectic. You've got everything from James Brown style workouts to more ambient music. Peace and Rhythm also has a bit of a throwback feel because his wife Sakina sings, and it's hard not to hear the echoes of the 60s girl group sound in her voice. But Muhammad's career was never about throwbacks. At this stage in the 1970s, he's about to embark on a phase with a new label, which would become a genre-defining sound. By late 1969, Muhammad is amongst the giants of session drumming in New York. He's then drawn into Creed Taylor's world of deeply funkified jazz, and despite his excellent previous work on soul and R&B and hard bop records, and notwithstanding the other work he'd do in his career with people like John Schofield and Ahmad Jamal and Pharaoh Sanders, it's with Creed Taylor's CTI and Kudu labels where Muhammad makes his greatest contribution, at least I think. And Taylor gives him tons of work right off the bat. In 1970 and 71, Muhammad plays on something like 35 or 36 separate LPs. For CTI and Kudu, he plays on a number of genre-defining records for people like Grover Washington Jr., Hank Crawford, and Bob James. He's a drummer on the heavily, heavily sampled track Nautilus on James' first record. Although he was never one to try and grab the spotlight, in 1974, Taylor asked Muhammad if he would step out as a leader. And this is where we get to this record. It's recorded in March 1974 at Van Gelder's Englewood Cliff Studio. Creed Taylor is a producer. Idris Muhammad is, of course, on drums, and he is backed up by what is, in retrospect, an all-star, all-world jazz funk lineup. This includes the keyboardist and arranger Bob James, the horn player Randy Brecker, the bassist Gary King, the guitarist Joe Beck, the percussionist Ralph McDonald, and on saxophone, the jazz funk icon Grover Washington Jr. Sidewell starts with Power of Soul, which is a cover of a track which actually occurs on a Hendrix record, this one, uh, Band of Gypsies, although on original pressings of Band of Gypsies, it's uh, referred to as Power to Love. That's actually a misprint. It's actually Power of Soul. This is arranged differently than the Hendrix track. There's this rumbling bass, which starts off. The horns then play the riff, which Hendrix would play, and they also, of course, cover the vocal line. It's built around the same hypnotic bass groove. I'm not so sure that the head arranger works that well, but it really does cook when we move on from that and we get into Grover's solo, which is superb. The other solos are quite nice as well. It's got a tasty percussion break and a trippy Hendrixy kind of outro. I don't think the Hendrix track translates as well as it might have done. I think this is the weakest of what are admittedly four strong tracks in this record. Peace of Mind is next, and this is a Bob James composition. This has a very Bob Jamesy acid trip meets yacht rock kind of a feel. That said, it's a great piece of music. Both Grover and Brecker solo over this sort of shimmering field of symbols which Idris is able to create. The rhythm section throughout is firmly in the pocket and then at the end when James comes in with his Fender Rose solo, this is jazz funk nirvana. On side two, The Saddest Thing, which is a Joe Beck composition, begins with this lovely slow groove, this great interplay between Beck and Washington. Becker's solo is equally gorgeous. Now, there's a risk of anything Bob James is involved with descending into easy listening, but the crispness of the drumming and the percussion prevents that from ever happening, and the song even survives a brief invasion by a string section at the end. Finally, we have Lauren's Dance, and this is the highlight of an already very strong record. It begins with a wicked Fender Rhodes intro, and the way that Washington plays the main riff is so open and spare, you can totally appreciate the tastefulness of Muhammad's playing underneath. There's a virtuoso trumpet solo by Brecker, and that leads into Grover Washington's moment. Now, he's the composer of the track, and this, I think, is one of his greatest moments on record ever, even if there is some sort of accidental loud honk of the tenor near the mic at one point. This is a tremendous record, even though it doesn't have a real jazz funk banger attention grabber like so many of the Kudu releases did. Instead, its appeal is more subtle. It's interesting and deeply rhythmic all the way through. Muhammad is never flashy, didn't write any of the songs, and he's not trying to grab attention with huge solos, but the rhythm is what makes this record work from start to finish. It gets better and better with each track, offers something new every time you listen, and for me, it's four and a half out of five stars.